Maria Wuthrich um, from uh, ETH Zurich in Switzerland. Um, so Mario is a professor of, of in the Department of Mathematics at ETH. Um, as well, he's an honorary visiting professor at the um, at City University of London, which he's been uh, there since 2011. Um, in the past, he also had a um, actual position in industry at, in, at uh, Winter Insurance in Switzerland. Um, and he's a qualified actuary of the uh, Swiss Actual Association. Um, he served on the board of the uh, SAA uh, during 2006-2018. Um, for the last few years, he has been the editor-in-chief of Aston Bulletin, which is one of the uh, uh, premier journals in actual science. Um, and um, he's won many uh, prizes over his career, um, including the um, Jeffrey Haywood Prize last year for a, um, a, to uh, for a paper on neural network extension of the Lee Carter model, so that's mortality modeling. Um, and then in 2021, he won another prize, um, the Brian Hay Prize of the Institute of, uh, and Faculty of Actuaries for the paper he's gonna present today, uh, which is called um, Local GLM Net Interpretable Deep Learning. Um, so um, Mario, we're very happy to have you and, and thanks for taking time um, out of your Friday night to be here with us uh, virtually. Um, the floor is all yours. I think the sharing just stopped. So good morning, California. So for you, it's still early. For me, it's already quite late. So I have been taking oral exams the whole day today, but don't worry, I'm not going to give you all the answers I received today. So I rather try to focus here on this topic, which is on deep learning, which is on neural network modeling. So the outline of my presentation is that I first would like to introduce the regression, or the regression problems. I'm going to give you a small example. Then the starting point is always a generalized linear model. So I'm going to introduce a generalized linear model. And then in the next step, which um, will also be quite a short one, I'm going to talk about neural networks as they can be seen as an extension to generalized linear models. So this is the part which is quite classical and well known. And then I'm going to build on these things and I'm going to introduce our new proposal, the local GLM net, which somehow tries to benefit from, from the strengths of GLMs, but also from the strengths of neural networks. And then I'm going to give you some examples or in particular one example, where you can see why this can be an advantage uh, in interpreting models in interpreting results and also for variable selection. And then I will give you a short outlook, which I just call regularization, which can have very different meanings. So we will see uh, how this will go. So briefly speaking, um, so typically we start with some data that we try to analyze, that we try to understand, and which we try to use to build models that allow us to predict what is going to happen in the future. And this is one example that is publicly available through this package of um, Christoph Dutang and uh, Arthur Charpentier. So this is one of these data sets in this CAS data sets R package. So we have roughly 600,000 insurance policies. They have a unique policy identifier and there is some information about their exposures. Then there are these covariates or these features or these explanatory variables. So this is the information about these insurance policies that we have. And then basically what we try to do is we try to model or predict the claims. And in this particular example, we do not have claim sizes, but we only would like to consider the number of claims. So we would like to predict or to estimate claim frequencies for these particular insurance policies. So first of all, of course, what you would do is you would just try to plot, analyze the data so that you uh, start to understand what the data is about, what the model might be looking like, how you should pre-process this data and so on. So these are just three plots that plot frequencies, which are always the number of claims divided by the exposure uh, for different um, age groups or age classes. So. I mean, we have the typical picture that young drivers, they have high frequencies and this data set, every third young driver has in average or 
in average, every third driver has one claim per year. Then they start to get more experience. So the claim frequency typically de decreases. And then there is this other nice little uh, phenomenon. So you typically have another small local maximum. And this is exactly when your kids start to drive on your car so that because these are so, so typically these numbers are not per driver, but rather by car. So that's how you can analyze the data. And you can already see from here that we get pictures which are highly nonlinear, which look quite complicated. So this is the picture for the age of driver. Then this is another picture, which also is this marginal plot that plots frequency with respect to, a, to the bonus malus level. So this is just past claims experience. Then this is the next one that shows you the frequencies with respect to car brands. So obviously this here is a car brand that causes more claims. And this seems to be one which has a lower frequency. So that's roughly what you get from the data. And you can already see that if you try to build models that reflect these uh, properties, these features, it, it's possibly not that simple because also these things start to interact because as you can guess, young drivers, they drive certain types of cars more frequently and so on. So you have these kind of interactions and so on. So the basic problem that you try to solve is the following. So what you try to find is a suitable regression function, which is a mapping that maps the information that you have of your policies. So these are these covariates or features to something which is called mu x. And mu x should just, uh, in this case, should just be the expected value of the random variables that we try to predict. So basically the problem that we have to solve is that we have to somehow extract the um, systematic effects out of this data so that we get a, a suitable description of or suitable predictors for these uh, random variables that we try to predict or random uh, variables or the insurance policies that we try to price. And state of the art or the classical way how you typically approach this problem is the following. So first of all, you have to pre-process or you have to modify the features or the covariates so that they are in a suitable form. And then what you do is you just choose a strictly monotone and typically smooth link function, which you apply to these expected values that you try to determine. And after applying this link function, you just make the model assumption. So this here, this equality sign is the model assumption that I make, namely that I have this uh, linear structure that the influence of all these covariates or the covariate components, uh, they are just in this linear fashion where again, these are the covariates and these beta. So these are the regression parameters that I try to estimate. So beta is the regression parameter. And then based on some distributional assumptions, I can estimate this parameter uh, typically using the myth, myth, maximum likelihood method. So typical examples that you would solve are Gaussian, Poisson, logistic, gamma, or inverse Gaussian models. So you should observe that these are all uh, examples that belong to the exp exponential dispersion family. So they are light-tailed, which is another difficulty that, that you are facing when you do this regression modeling, but this is not really the part that we would like to focus on here. The crucial thing that I would like to highlight is that these GLMs, they are linear in the covariates after applying this link function. So this is exactly what I mean by linearity that this access, the influence, uh, the regression function on this canonical scale, uh, on this uh, uh, linear scale uh, linearly. So if, if this is just a, the pure age of driver, then typically if beta would be negative, then this would just be a monotonically decreasing function in the age of driver, which might not be suitable as we have seen before. So this requires that we do this pre-processing or this covariate engineering. And this is exactly what people in practice have been doing or what, what they have been learning over the last 50 years, how they can bring their information into an appropriate form so that this GLM structure really is a, let's say, good model in order to do the pricing and predict these claims. Now, the step from generalized linear models to neural networks is a quite small one. Uh, if you 
believe into these two formulas here. So as you can see is if you go from a generalized linear model to a neural network, the only thing that you do is that you replace these, let's call them original features or original covariates, you, you replace them by an object that looks as follows. So this is just a function which modifies the axis and this function here that does this modification, this is exactly a neural network, which is typically, let's say a complex function that has many parameters involved as we will see. And what this network is doing after it has been appropriately trained, it just gives you a new, new representation of the covariates of the features. So basically this network is representation learning. So it just gives you a new representation of your features such that after having transformed your information, this linear form. So again, you should observe that this is still linear after doing this transformation. This linear form gives you after um, the application of this link function, uh, a suitable now um, regression function that you use for doing your uh, predictions. Now, these neural networks, if they are well trained, they typically outperform generalized linear models. And this is partly because these uh, neural networks, they have the universal approximation property, which means that they are fa fairly flexible. So you have a fairly flexible class of functions here that you can feed to the data. Um, it's not quite fair to say so, because if a neural network outperforms the generalized linear model, it just means if I go back, then maybe if you have pre-processed or if you have done this uh, feature engineering manually, then you just have not done it in an optimal way, which means that uh, this automated engineering by the network is done better. So you could go back to your data, you could try to, modify and differently um, pre-process your information. And if you work hard, then I'm sure that you may get this on a similar level, at least for simple problems. And simple would mean for problems that we have been starting from on the first slide. A clear advantage is that a neural network can process any kind of information. So what we have seen so far was just table or data, but of course, if you have neural networks that then you can also process images, you can process texts and so on. So this is really the step where neural networks can go beyond uh, classical generalized linear models. Now, somehow the weaknesses, and that's exactly where um, we would like to improve these neural networks or try to modify is that it's not quite interpre interpretable or explainable. So at the end of the day, if they outperform, we only know that they have found a better representation, but somehow we don't really know how this has been done, nor do we get better insight or some insight uh, how, or, so, or we can learn how we can do the manual feature, feature engineering in a better way, because as I said, so this is somehow like a black box that is quite difficult to, um, interpret so that you can extract the information that has been learned by the neural network. And the other way, the other problem that is also difficult and which, I mean, machine learning people, they do not care too much about this part, but actually for actuarial modeling, you would like to know which are the important variables, which one are less important. And that's another thing which is quite difficult with neural networks that they do this variable selection. So this is another weakness that cannot easily be solved by just using a plain vanilla neural network. So what we have been coming up with now is that we try to um, stick to the generalized linear model structure that we have been starting from as close as possible. And instead of modifying or instead of learning uh, new representations of these features, what we rather try to do is we try to learn um, these regression parameters. So before we were estimating them using maximum likelihood estimate uh, estimation, 
And now what the Rada try to do is we say, okay, we try to learn them now, which means that we set up a neural network. So this network now should um, map the input features. So this is the information that we have. So they should map this um, information to, uh, let's say, um, beta functions or these regression weights that of course have to have the same dimension so that I can still calculate or calculate these color products. So what I do is I define or I set up a neural network so that the neural network exactly tries to model now these um, parameters, but not as constants that I can estimate, but rather as functions which have uh, internal parameters that I try to estimate so that this um, learned functions exactly will give me the right uh, or good parameters in order to do this predictive task. So if you plug this in, then it just means that I try to analyze now the function, which is nonlinear now in the axis, because x will show up both in these weights, which are now the outputs, the output of the networks uh, multiplied with the original features. Um, um, as they come from the original data. So if you want a picture, it roughly looks like this. If I try to model this beta, so you have your information. In our case, this will be something which has a dimension eight. And then the network, it has always this complicated structure with these hidden layers. So that's how this um, um, original information is transformed. And then the output here in our case will be also be uh, of the same dimension, which is dimension eight. So this will exactly be this beta chase evaluated in the axis, which will be the weights that we learn in order to do this regression modeling. So why is this now attractive? So this is attractive because we can learn something here that we can interpret. So, for instance, so assume we have learned now these weights, I'm going to highlight how this is done. So if we have learned these weights, then if we learn a weight that is identically equal to zero, then it just means that this particular term that corresponds to this index J, it can be dropped. Because if this is identically equal to zero, I don't need this particular term. If I learn here a regression weight that is constantly equal to a beta j, let's assume it is no zero, then I just have a classical GLM term that I have learned. So that's how you can extract or try to extract the terms that should enter your regression model in a linear fashion. If you learn a regression weight that does not depend on all the covariates, but only on the xj, that corresponds to the XJ that you are multiplying it with, then obviously this particular term will not have any interaction with any other term because this J here remains somehow isolated. And more generally, if you try to understand and learn interactions, then what you would just do here is you just calculate the gradient and for all the components that will not or do not vanish, uh, you will have an interaction. So if the first component here, so if the first partial derivative is x1 of beta j doesn't vanish, then obviously you will have an interaction where you have an x1 here, a function that depends on x1, which is multiplied with the xj. So you can observe that you start to get the transparency and you can start to understand what this network is learning so that you can hopefully benefit from this knowledge. And if you want, you could also then go back to your generalized linear model and try to improve your generalized linear model pre-processing or the modeling. So by um, the interactions here or the nonlinear terms that you have learned from this uh, uh, local GLM net approach. So by the way, why do we call it local GLM net? So you should observe that if this beta J is more or less constant within a small environment of a given X, then of course, uh, within this environment, you just have locally, you have a classical generalized linear model. There is one drawback, which is the identifiability. So 
obviously this local GLM net does not really lead to an identifiable, fully identifiable function, because what might happen is that you learn a beta J times XJ or a beta J, which has exactly the structure XJ uh, prime divided by XJ. So it means that you just learn an XJ so that you have two terms XJ in the summation. So that's the identifiability issue that you have. And that's also why I always talk here about terms. So you should drop the term, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you should completely drop this um, covariate component because it may still have an important influence in one of these weights. So if you wanna test whether you should drop the whole um, covariate component, then you have to refit the network where you drop it. And then um, you will, um, you can decide whether you should keep or drop. But still, this already gives the first indication which particular terms you should try to look at if you try to reduce uh, the complexity of your model. Uh, just about this identifiability issue. So the nice thing is that if you use gradient descent fitting, and that's a classical way how you fit these models, then we have never really encountered this difficulty that we learn a weight like this because um, gradient descent fitting is something which is comparably um, 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 uh, slow and not too flexible. And actually what is, happen what is typically happening is that the solution of your gradient descent fitting um, algorithm is already quite predetermined by these linear functions here. So it tries to build these um, parameters here or these regression parameter functions around these linear terms. And at least in our experience on different examples, uh, it was almost impossible or it was impossible to learn a uh, weights so that from one linear term, we drop into a different uh, uh, linear component. So I would say this is more, let's say a mathematical issue, but from a practical point of view, at least in our examples, this was a negligible problem. So what I would like to do is I would like to give you a little example. And this example is one which is on simulated data because this has the big advantage that we know the true regression function and we can precisely analyze whether what we learn is really what should be learned. So the regression function will depend on covariates or features that have eight components. So this is exactly the picture that I had before. So that's why my X is at so let's go back. So that's exactly why I had these um, um, eight um, input components here in this neural network. And the architecture that I'm going to study is exactly this uh, three hidden layer architecture that will have 20 neurons, 50 neurons, and 10 neurons in these three hidden layers. And we have, if we have this eight dimensional input, then of course the out, uh, output also has to be eight dimensional as illustrated here. So I'm going to have an eight, eight dimensional input. Then I assume that the true regression function has, per, has exactly this structure. And that's what I would like to learn, or at least I try to approximate by this neural network, um, by these weights from the neural networks that we have just seen. So by this uh, GL, local GLM net proposal. So I assume to have a first term, which is linear, and this linear term doesn't have any interaction with other terms, then I would like to have a quadratic term, which also doesn't have any interaction. Then I have a third term, which looks a bit more complicated. So I have a sine function and I have an absolute value here for the third term, which only depends on the third component of my covariates. And then I have here a term where I have an interaction between two linear terms. I have a second interaction term, which is a bit more complicated. And then what you should observe is that I have two additional components here in my features, which do not enter the regression function at all. And of course, what I would like to find is that the regression function that I start to learn or this regression function I try to approximate that I somehow can find that I should not, uh, these should not enter. Um, or these do not enter. So that's the part where I do variable selection that they should not enter firstly. And secondly, of course, then I somehow would like to find uh, to see whether I can find this uh, functional form 
on the remaining components. So what I do is I just first simulate covariates. So I simulate the portfolio features. And then based on these features or covariates, I simulate the responses, which are in my simulation. These are just Gaussian. And I assume that they have means which are exactly described by this um, true or synthetic regression function. As already mentioned, so for my weights, I have this network of depth four, which has exactly this number of neurons that I would like to learn. And then the fitting, I mean, as I said, state of the art is I just use stochastic gradient descent. I split my data into training data and validation data, and I ex explore early stopping just to ensure that the neural network does not overfit to the in-sample data. So that's what I do. And then what do I get as my result? So as my result, I get pictures like this, where I have now these eight um, covariate components. So this is the first one, second one, third one, fourth one, and so on. So the dots that you can see here, these are exactly the beta j axis. So these are the components, these eight components in the betas that I try to learn. Now, the first observation is that I get these clouds. So I don't get straight lines, I get clouds. And the clouds exactly come from the fact that I simulate data. And then there is in the data, so there is some noisy part. And of course, this noisy part will introduce also in the estimation of these betas will introduce some in, induce some fluctuations. And that's exactly why we get clouds here instead of uh, uh, straight lines. But if I just focus here now on the first one, on beta one, which corresponds to this first term here. So what I learn here is a cloud, which is uh, roughly centered around 0.5. So it seems that I have learned here the right regression weight, which is 0.5. Then the beta two, I learn something which looks like a straight line that has a negative slope of one quarter. So if you decouple here the second term, it's just minus one quarter x2 times x2. So the beta that I would like to learn is minus one quarter times x2. So that's exactly what I learned. The, the next term, which is looks, looks more complicated, so I have to divide by x3 and multiply by x3. But indeed, I learned something which looks like a sine function, at least if you are generous with me. So it seems that also in this case, I have learned something which looks quite useful in understanding this functional, that is this term here of my true regression function. Then for x4, I get a cloud which has a more wide diameter. And having a more wide diameter means that we have more fluctuations in the beta. So this is a sign that actually for x4, I expect in interactions with other parameters. So that's already what I get here. The same holds true for the x5. Um, x Six is also a bit more widespread than, let's say, x1, which indicates that I expect some interactions. But here I have to be careful. And also, this is about identification because I can either allocate this to the term x5 or to the term x6. And then finally, x7 and x8, these are fairly much concentrated around zero. And the fluctuation here is pretty small which is already a strong indication that actually x7 and x8, they should not enter the regression function. Now, if you try to analyze parameter selection uh, slightly more in a slightly more sophisticated way, then what I would do or what we propose to do is that you add an artificial variable which does not enter the true regression function. So if you have your data, let's say from the second slide, I just add another variable, which is completely independent of your data, and you um, simulate, so just this feature. And then what you try, so of course, this completely random covariate um, will not have any explanatory power, 
and this completely additional random covariate will tell you how much the typical fluctuation here, so coming from the noise should be. And that's exactly what we propose. So that you add such a variable, that you analyze the beta of this additional purely random variable. Uh, 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 now in our case, we didn't do this because we already know that um, 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 we have this additional variable so we can directly analyze them. So first of all, we see that these variables, they are pretty much centered around zero. You can also calculate the empirical standard deviation that these beta parameters get. And they seem to be fairly unbiased. And this uh, standard deviation, this is roughly what you would get also if you would add an additional other variable, because we already know that this is the fluctuation that you typically get. And then what you can just do is you just do an empirical Wald test that you do an null hypothesis, which states that a particular variable should not, should not be included. Then having this uh, magnitude of fluctuation that you typically would get, you can, uh, you can design um, confidence bounds. So you can start to analyze um, confidence intervals. And this is exactly what we did here. So we calculate this confidence bounds where we either base this um, 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 fluctuation on this estimate on, or on that one. So they are slightly different, but fairly similar compared to the remaining ones. You can, pl you can plot those, it somehow looks like this. And then the conclusion that you uh, typically would make is that if these clouds are fairly much uh, concentrated within this uh, light blue band, which exactly corresponds now to this um, um, uh, confidence intervals or confidence bounds, then you would uh, not reject the null hypothesis to uh, reject this. Um, uh, you would not reject the null hypothesis to drop this variable. And in all the other cases, you would reject this null hypothesis. And this is exactly what is happening here. So you can observe that none of these other uh, components is fully concentrated or almost fully concentrated within this confidence bounds, which tells you that these are the variables that you should consider in your regression model. So that's how you can interpret what you get and how you can do variable selection. Uh, the other part is that you can start to analyze now interactions. And these are exactly the plots that I have been plotting here. So I calculate now these gradients. So the gradient beta, so this, the partial derivatives of beta j with respect to all these components, if you consider the first term. So I drop now the last two components that do not enter here, the regression function. So if I calculate the gradient of beta one uh, with respect to all, this all the other components, and this gradient is roughly, so this is already a spline fit to the gradients because also, of course, these gradients will be a bit noisy. So I will get clouds, clouds like that, and I can just do a spline fit to, the, uh, to this cloud. Now for the first term, they seem to be fairly zero. And of course, if you consider this, if you calculate the gradient of the true regression function with respect to all this uh, to x, then this gradient is just identically equal to zero. Uh, if you do it for the second term, then you should observe that only one component, which is the, the, the well, only one partial derivative, the one with res respect to component x2, is different from zero. So this means that likely the second component doesn't have any interaction with all the other ones. And this one should be roughly 0.5 times x, what I get, and or minus 0.5. And indeed, this is fairly close to, the, to what I have here. So also in this case, I can almost precisely recover the right structural form here. The next term is a bit more complicated, but also here we can see that only one partial derivative is substantially different from zero. And actually for term X3, it's the one that is with respect to component X3 and all the others are fairly zero, which also highlights that this term doesn't have any interactions. 
And now it starts to get more interesting. So if I consider X4, then it seems that the gradient at a partial derivative with X5 is non-zero. So this highlights that I expect that there is an interaction between X4 and X5. And indeed, that's what I find here, that uh, indeed this is what it is, what is true here. So also here, I get fairly close to what I try to recover. If I consider X5, I get gradients different from zero or partial derivatives different for zero for X4. And actually this is, I think, X6. It's also somehow highlights that, sorry, X5 here has one with X4. So obviously this interact, so this term here is allocated to the two different terms. Whereas also this here, I somehow find by um, getting here a partial derivative here with respect to X6 for beta um, five being different from zero. And then funny for X6, X6, everything looks to be fairly zero, which highlights that X6 doesn't have any interactions with any other terms. That's not quite true because we have this term here, but it seems that this term is already fully um, um, taken care of by this particular uh, part of um, my estimated function. So I get fairly close to what I um, would like to get. So I tried, I find, let's say the right functional forms. I try, I find the interactions, maybe not the full functional form, but I get quite some insight and that's exactly a major advantage that this um, um, proposal has over classical um, neural networks. You can also do other nice things. So you can start to define importance measures. So a quite simple way to do so is that you just calculate the average over the absolute values over all these weights. So if I consider, let's say the chase components, I get the importance weight for the chase components. And then you get so, such plots. So it seems that X1 here is quite an important component. X3 is an important component. And what you should observe is that if you introduce this importance measure, then what my proposal does, um, it proposes that X7 and X8 are the least important components. And obviously also this is a, a valid conclusion because these are the two components that um, were not entering the true regression function. So let me give you a brief conclusion or a short discussion before I give you a short outlook. So this proposal provides us with an explainable regression model. So we can start to analyze what this regression model has learned. And as we have seen, at least in this toy example is that the conclusions that we draw are indeed the right ones or are valid ones. So the additional remark is that of course we have applied this to many other data sets, also the real data we have seen in the beginning. And also there we believe that the conclusions that we draw are the right ones though, because for this true data, the true model, or of course the data generating mechanism is not known. So that's why we cannot uh, really fully verify uh, uh, this claim. So it allows for variable selection doing, let's say an empirical wall test as I have been highlighting. Then it allows for a natural measure of importance. So you can define this importance measure, which people in practice like to have that often makes sense, not always, because I mean, if you have these nonlinear terms and nonlinear effects, you have to be a bit careful how you interpret this. If you just add absolute values of um, regression weights or parameters. And as I have been highlighting also the interaction effects, somehow I can extract, at least in my toy model, I have fully been recovering uh, uh, which variables interact with which other ones. Now somehow the problem that we haven't really solved yet is the 
is that all these considerations have been built on continuous variables. So continuous variables, they are nice because somehow, or continuous variables by definition have one dimensional um, 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 representation. If you have categorical variables, so if you have nominal variables, then things start to get more complicated. So for instance, if you think of car brands, then car brands have to be embedded into um, Euclidean spaces. So typically what you do is dummy coding or one hot encoding. And this leads, if you have many different car brands, so this leads to high dimensional representations. And unfortunately, uh, for very high dimensional problems, uh, I have to admit that um, um, these uh, local GLM nets, that they, um, let's say they, they are not that uh, stable or not that robust. So they are quite sensitive in high dimensions. So you typically explore, uh, uh, you typically um, um, apply more early stopping um, just because the noisy part, um, or you have more, let's say you have more um, de degrees of freedom for overfitting, which means that typically these local GLM nets are not fully compatible, uh, 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 competitive uh, with classical neural networks uh, in this particular situation. So categorical variables are more difficult, and that's part of the regularization that I would like to mention uh, in the next slide. Another way how you could solve this problem is that you embed categorical variables into low dimensional spaces by doing an embedding learning where um, um, typically um, levels or labels that um, are more similar for the regression task that are more close to, to each other in this low dimensional embedding. And then you only work with this low dimensional embedding. So for instance, you embed the car brands, if you have hundreds of car, or let's say 100 car brands, you embed them into a five dimensional space where, I don't know, European cars, they would somehow cluster, Japanese cars would cluster and so on, so that you embed them in a meaningful way and then you just work with this embedding. So that's how you can um, transform categorical variables to low dimensional representations, which could then be used for these local GLM nets, which of course will work much better than dummy coding or one hot encoding. The other thing is that this um, local GLM net, like other neural networks, they will have a bias. And of course, this is something which is very unpleasant in pricing. So it means that the price level will not be at the right level because um, typically you either under or overestimate if you have a bias. So you need to correct for this bias, which um, can be done as I will highlight. So this is the second way how you can understand the regularization. So as I said, this can have different meanings that I quickly would like to highlight. Um, as I said, if we have two high dimensional models, then um, our proposal um, more likely leads to overfitting than classical neural networks. And that's why predictive power of our uh, proposal is slightly less good or they are less uh, competitive than classical neural networks. But nevertheless, what you can do, you can still use this model. You can learn the structure that the data may have. And then you can do variable selection. And once you have selected your variables, then you can still fit a classical neural network on the selected variables, which then would allow you to improve this predictive power if somehow uh, you struggle exactly with this particular point. So this is a short discussion. Um, I hear someone. Otherwise, I would <laughs> go to the outlook. So. As I said, there is still the difficulty that we uh, cannot really deal with categorical variables. Also, uh, variable selection with categorical variables is more difficult. Now, the proposal that we have is the following. So if you have uh, covariates uh, that have a natural group structure, so for instance, if you think of the car brands or of different regions, 
then you, let's say we use dummy coding. So you have here a zero one coding for the regions will, which will give you a natural group. And then of course, if you would like to do this wall test from before, you should do this um, such a test on the entire group simultaneously. And the typical way how you deal with this problem is that you use group lasso regularization. And of course, something quite similar could also be done now in our proposal. So you just have your responses and this is our local GLM net uh, regression function that we had before. As I said, you do gradient descent fitting, which means that you um, choose a loss function or an objective function that you try to minimize and or try to get small with gradient descent fitting. So you try to get this loss small, which will give you an optimal, hopefully, parameter, network parameter. And now what you can do if you have this natural group structure, what you could just try to do is that you have this, um, these weights that you learn. And now if you have this group, then for each group, you just do this uh, penalization, which is uh, an L2 penal penalization. And the, the, the lasso group lasso um, 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 penalization works like this, that if you have this particular structure, and if you let this regularization parameter, which can be chosen individually for each of this group, if you let this become bigger and bigger, then eventually um, these betas, they will be shrinked to zero uh, will, be sh uh, will, will decrease, so they will shrink, and they will eventually they will be shrinked uh, precisely uh, to zero. And that's exactly here what we did in one of our examples, and this is the example we have seen before. So we try to analyze now um, learning the network under this regularization. So we have a first um, group here, so this is a first, uh, 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 a categorical variable where we do dummy coding. Then we have a second group here. So these are the car brands I have been mentioning now many times. And these here are all my continuous variables. So I have um, six continuous variables and I have two categorical components. And I now exactly do this um, regularization. If I do not have any regularization, then I get the green column. So that's the regression weights that I get. And now if I start to increase the, these um, uh, regularization parameters eta, then if I slightly increase them, then the betas will be, uh, shri they will shrink. So they shrink to the yellow part. If I increase them more, they shrink to the red part. So you can start to analyze which of these um, 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 groups are now uh, made small or sufficiently small that it high, uh, that um, you um, may be able to drop them. So if you apply this um, 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 variable selection tool, it seems that one variable is fairly unimportant. And also this categorical variable um, seems to be um, not that important. So these are the candidates. If you would like to um, um, have a smaller models, this would be the candidates that you may drop from the model. Uh, so that you have a lower dimensional model that hopefully is still uh, good enough to do the pricing exercise. So this is a regularization or what you could do for categorical variable selection in our proposal, which is not that different from what you do in GLMs. And the second part, this is exactly uh, what I try to highlight with the balanced property. So if you estimate um, your regression function, and if you add up now all your um, um, uh, estimated prices, so if you aggregate those, so in our proposal, this is just exactly this function. So this is what we have learned uh, on the uh, linear scale, then we apply the inverse of the link function. So that's the prices that we charge in a, from our estimated model. And then we aggregate over the portfolio. And now the unpleasant thing that typically happens is that this is different from the total observations that you have. 
And of course, if this is different, then it also means that you have a bias because if you calculate now this expected value here on the left-hand side, so typically this has more often one sign or the other sign, so this you have to analyze, uh, but it means that this will be biased so that you either overcharge or undercharge uh, your portfolio because in average, you should just um, price this portfolio by the expected value of this wise. So you have this bias, which asks for correction. If you work with a generalized linear model uh, under canonical link, then you have the so-called balance property. And the balance property is that these generalized linear models, they have the nice um, side effect or the nice uh, consequence of this GLM that actually here you get a precise identity. So a GLM with canonical link is always unbiased. And that's exactly now where we have to improve our model. But also this is not that difficult. So if you consider the proposal that has been published two years ago, what you could interpret or how you could interpret this problem now is as follows. So you could interpret this now as a newly learned covariate or as a new representation of your information. And then you just use this as a new covariate and then you apply just a classical GLM. And if this here is not a canonical link, you can estimate this um, intercept or bias parameter, these regression parameters. So you can estimate them just by a classical additional GLM step. And then actually what you have learned here is an alpha J hat times beta J hat and this alpha zero hat. And if you then use this model, this will exactly have the balance property. So this will correct for this bias or for the failure of this balance property, which as a consequence will be a model that is free of, uh, which is unbiased. Okay, so these are somehow the outlook, which hasn't been done, let's say on paper, but I think it's fairly straightforward how these things should be solved. So I would like you, I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer hopefully any questions that you have.